brief thumbnail sketch of the passover that is specifically identified and given in great detail in the book of exodus the old testament it is because of the passover and what jesus used out of it to establish what we call the lord's supper and that is why it is before us not that we come to celebrate the passover I think that some in the past have become a little bit confused because we do this and so they start looking for that as a part of the the Lord's Supper in our Christian celebration, our Christian worship. Make no uh, doubt about it, uh, uh, Resurrection Sunday, the Easter season, Holy Week, all of that is Christian. Amen. And I think during this time there are some who we run into it and they say things like, well, I don't celebrate that. And that's all right. Amen. Because it's a privilege as a Christian to celebrate as we celebrate. And everybody, amen, does not have that privilege. Let's just be honest about it. And so I thank God for the privilege uh, that he has provided for us a place called heaven. And one day we'll fly away. But um, tonight, uh, I do want to share just a few items uh, it's been a long day, so I won't take all of this. I want to give you the thumbnail high points of this Passover to show you how for hundreds of years the Jews celebrated based on what God did for the children of Israel out of Egypt as he struck down the oppressor, he struck down the oppressor in Egypt and save Israel from, amen. The very thing that was being poured out on a nation, in the midst of that nation, God saved. In the midst of hell going on, God still saves. And so we want to make sure that you understand, out of the Passover, out of the Old Testament Jewish Passover, the Lord Jesus establishes a new covenant he establishes a new agreement between God and man based only on the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the fact that he gave his body, amen, his body's broken, his blood shed, that we might have a right to the tree of life. So I want to simply, uh, let's do two things. I need uh, some help. Uh, we always start it that way, and I want to do that because that's a very important part. Uh, I want the oldest uh, sister in the house. Uh, so I'm going to start at 80. Do we have anybody that's 80 years old in this house? 81? Anybody older than 81? We got somebody 82? All right. Now, now that's my grandson back there. Sit down, put your hand down. Come on, Sister Smith. Amen. Mother Smith, come on up here. Now, the reason I'm calling her out and I ask for the oldest female, there are a number of things in our Christian uh, tradition, in our custom, that honors uh, the matriarch of the family. And you'll hear two words quite often in our family circles. You hear the word matriarch and you hear the word patriarch. Uh, patriarch is the, elder, is the elder male of the family. Not just that little unit, but the family group. And so he is the patriarch. But the elder female in the family group is called the matriarch. And uh, in the Jewish family, there was the matriarch who had the responsibility of lighting the candles. You have what the Jewish candle is called the menorah. There are seven candles in the menorah. They represent the seven original feasts. You also have a nine-stem menorah, which includes the two additional feasts that were added during the exile, which is what we would call the time in between the Old and the New Testament, okay? As a matter of fact, one of those additional is called Hanukkah. They celebrate even Hanukkah today. So Hanukkah and the Feast of Purim, those are two that were added to the original seven, and every Jew still celebrate. As a matter of fact, alongside of our Christian uh, celebration of Christmas, you'll find Jewish families celebrating Hanukkah 
because both of them are about a celebration of lights, lights. And that's exactly what the matriarch does. The matriarch lights these candles. And um, if you have a hard time, another eye. I got some deacons over here that'll help you with this thing. Now, I've never got, I don't know, I guess we just buy the, the cheap ones, I guess, uh, you know. But I know you got nimble fingers, you know. I started to show you how, there you go, pushing up and over. And if you light those candles, and while she's doing that, not only does the oldest uh, female in the family have a part, because lighting those candles starts the whole celebration. And if you've ever noticed, come on, Deacon Miles, you can help. Not you, Smith. Come on, Deacon. Amen. I have a reason. Amen. Uh, if you notice today, we had great fun. We had family here. But we had a bunch of children over there. Children were, they had their own little time. They were going around picking up eggs and throwing candy and wouldn't give me candy and all that. But in every Passover, there's also something for our young people. There's, it's intricately involved with young people, and it's, a, it's intertwined in the celebration. The patriarch of the family, he leads the meal, but he also makes sure that the children are involved. They played something that we call in our, our modern culture, we call it hide and seek. But it's actually a Jewish tradition. The patriarch would go and he'd hide little pieces of leaven. In the Jewish tradition, leaven symbolized sin. They would hide little pieces of leaven all over the house, and the children would go, and they'd find those little pieces of leaven, and they'd say, leaven, just like our bingo players would say bingo. And they'd holler out that they had it, all right? They'd take it to the patriarch, and he would deal with it. He would take it to the fireplace, and he'd throw it in and burn the leaven. In other words, they would be getting rid of sin out of the house. Are y'all walking with me? And so in the Passover, there was a responsibility for the youngest, and sometimes they would only choose one if it was a small family, but if it was a, quite a substantial family, and you had a smaller family that lived next door, they would incorporate them in, which says that we incorporate others into our family. That's, that's another story. Amen. In the wilderness, the children of Israel were led in there by the power of God. But if you go back and you read, you'll find that there's a group that was with them, was not a part of the 12 tribes, uh, but they were there, and they were called, that they were a different group, okay? They were a group that kind of were attached, okay? And so they went out of Egypt and came into the promised land just like the 12 tribes, okay? But the children had a part. Every child, who is the youngest child that can read? All right, how many of our young people, you can read? I need four hands, four hands, all right? Come on, that's one, two, three. Give me the youngest, the youngest. Who, who's, who's the youngest back there? Who, who are you pointing to? I can't see his head, now. who is that? Elijah, can, Elijah, you can read. Who, who's younger, how old is Elijah? Where's mom? Five, who's back there younger than five? You're younger than five, Christian? You're not younger than five. Come Elijah, come Elijah, who, okay, who's six? Y'all using all my time. Okay, all right. Six. Six. Come on, my six. Y'all, can y'all read? I want to know. You got to get up here and read. Now, don't get scared in front of these people. I know they're frowning, but come on. Who, any, my, my readers, I need readers. Five, six. Five, six, and seven. If you can read, I need you up here. Five, six, and seven. Can you read? Come on. Can you? Come on. I see a hand here. You want to go? Come. I'll help you read. Come on. I'll help you read. Come on. All right. All right. Come on, baby. All right. Come right on up. Come up here so everybody can see you. All right. One, two, three, four. 
Now, the reason that I've asked them to come, turn around and face the, the congregation, the reason I've asked them to come, because in the Jewish Passover, there is a point in there where they make sure that not only the oldest matriarch, but the children, the fruit, amen, has participated. There are four questions just prior to the meal that's going to be partaken of that they have children, the, the youngest among them, that can read, they participate, okay? Because what starts the story, the patriarch has the responsibility for sharing the story of the Passover. And the questions that the babies ask, they're led to ask, that's the foundation, that's the backdrop for the story of the Exodus, okay? And so I'm going to kind of, now my writing is, all right, see number one? Wait a minute, don't take it too far. Okay, can you read number one, read number one. On our on all other night we eat leavened bread. Why do we only eat bread? Un unleavened bread? Unleavened bread on tonight. Stay right there. Hold it. Number two. Uh, stay right there. On the other night, we eat all herbs. herbs. But, on tonight. but on tonight, we only eat bitter herbs. Why? Why? Number three. On, on all of other nights we don't dip our meals, but on tonight we dip twice. Why? Mm -hmm. right. Hold it. Hold it. Uh, on tonight, tonight we, recline. we recline at our mail, but not on other nights. Why? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, report back. You can report back to your family. <laughs> Our future is secure. Amen. <laughs> We're going to pray hard, though. Amen. Listen, uh, and, and that's exactly what it's intended to be. It's intended to incorporate the entire family into the partaking of the Passover. Everybody gets involved because it's family. That's what family is about, okay? And whether you know it or not, that's what church is. The church is about being a family. The Lord's family, he's developing, he's building his family. The Jewish Passover had various elements. We have things in the Christian church that begins uh, pretty much like the Passover. We have marriage. It is a sacred right. Marriages don't start. When you have an official marriage, the marriage doesn't start until the mothers of the bride and groom come in and they light a candle. Then the ceremony begins because when the, only the mother, and I've heard guys come up and say, I raised this child all by myself. I'm going to light this candle. That's because they don't understand. You see, the lighting of this candle is by female because it represents bringing light into the world. It represents the birth of a life, a soul, bringing that soul into the world. That's what Mary did for Jesus. It's the representative or representation of bringing light into the world. Remember when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now you are the light. You're the light. And so light represents the presence of that individual soul, okay? Uh, when a mother at a wedding lights a candle for her daughter, she's saying, I brought this light by the grace of God into the world. When the mother of the groom 
goes over and lights a candle saying, I brought this light by the grace of God into the world. I, I'm going to tell y'all a secret. Men can't have babies. <laughs> the candles. Everything on here is the white, the white uh, plates, the white what they call napkins or envelopes, the uh, tablecloth, all of this. This represents purity. It is the same covering that you find on the Lord's Supper table. It represents the same thing. It represents purity, the purity of the table. It belongs to the Lord. It is holy. There are, I thought I had some water up here. Let me say it like this. I'm going to give you several things. Thank you. And I'm only going to call these out. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing a lot here. I promised uh, Deaconess Tuggles that I wouldn't spend time talking about the whole thing because it would take too much time and I oftentimes get lost and uh, start sharing a lot. And I don't want to do that tonight because I want us to get to the Lord's Supper and I want you to come back at 6.30 Sunday morning for sunrise service. There are some, in no particular instance, they have these water and it's always salt water. Salt water represents the sea. The Red Sea or the Jordan, but the sea no doubt. For Passover, the children of Israel would have gone through the Red Sea. Thus, the bitter herbs in modern day they use things like this. It's called horseradish, nothing more than bitter herbs. But in antiquity, they would use herbs. It represents slavery, the burden, the hardness of slavery of the Jews. They would dip twice, one for Egypt, uh, Israel going in and coming out unharmed, and the, twi the twice, the second dip, is dipped in the water and immediately eaten by the patriarch, I'm not eating this, uh, immediately eaten to represent Egypt being consumed. And so that night, it's twice dipped and it represents Israel being saved and Egypt being destroyed. Amen? By the way, there's a passage in scripture where it says that Jesus sopped or he dipped, okay, the Bible says, Jesus said, the one that I give the dip or the dip in with me, he is the one. That's what they're talking about. That's what they're talking about. That is what answers the question. A lot of people ask the question, did Judas have and share in the Lord's Supper? And the question is, no, he did not because he left when this was this dipping. And the dipping is when he gave it to him. So we know by that action and the process of the Passover, that he did not partake of the Lord's Supper because the Lord's Supper was not established until after the meal. I wish I had a witness of it. There are four cups used in the Jewish Passover. There are four cups of wine. Each cup of wine has a name in the Jewish culture and it has a position we know which cup Jesus used because he gives the position of the cup he used. During, before the meal, and I've waited this time to share this, he would have done this sooner, but the first cup, somebody say first cup. First cup, first cup called the cup of blessing. Cup of blessing is used like when we go to a restaurant or in our home and we thank the Lord for our food, when we get, say grace. I grew up, my mom, they taught me, say grace. Tell the Lord thank you for your food. Well, they use the first cup to do just that. That is the cup of blessing. It is where they tell the Lord, God, thank you for the meal they're about to consume. By the way, the Jewish Passover is not just any meal. 
Jewish Passover is a lot like our Thanksgiving, our family reunion, and our Christmas all rolled up into one. So it's a big deal. The family is brought together. You're not just having a snack. You're not just having a meal after work. It's a big deal. So the first cup is called the cup of blessing. That cup starts right after the candles because the candles are lit, starts everything. Then you have the cup of blessing. You're blessing all of it. These plates, use them for eating, but they're not used for anything else. They're only used once a year. As is everything else here, it is sanctified. Sanctified means set aside. You know, sister, when you have some good dishes and you, know, you, you only want to use them for special times, well, that's what this is. They only use these dishes, they're sanctified for the time of Passover. And so, the patriarch would take the second cup and he'd take a plate and the wine in this second cup is not consumed. It is actually called the cup of plague because those 10 plagues that God poured out on Egypt but saved Israel from, he pours a drop by naming each one of those plagues and shows that they are poured out and nothing is a better picture than to see the red of that wine. And oh, by the way, it's always red wine. There were three kinds of wine, just so you'll know, during that time that they often drank at different times. They had red wine, they had white wine, and they had black wine. But you could only use red wine in the Passover. Only red wine. And just prior to the meal, they would remember all ten plagues, the patriarch would Remember all of those plagues, and they would recount them one by one, the last being the plague of the death of the firstborn, okay? Now, before you have the, or right after the cup of blessing, remember the baby said, on all other nights we eat leavened bread, but on tonight we eat unleavened bread. This is Jewish bread. It's called matzah. Matzah is a Jewish unleavened bread. It means that this bread is baked with no false risers. So there's no salt in it. There's no uh, baking powder. There's no nothing to cause bread. If you go and buy a loaf of uh, rainbow bread, and it's all nice and soft and all of that, that's because it has yeast in it. It has yeast, amen. Yeast, that's, that's some good stuff. But without all of that, and the reason that it's fluffy and nice is because it has a false riser, all right? Matzak has no false riser. You know where I'm going, don't you? Jesus rose, but he's not a false riser, okay? Matzak is oftentimes during this time of year sold in stores like uh, Kroger, H-E-B, and they're specifically reaching out to their Jewish clients in the community. Oh, they know that you know, we have our interest too, but when you go over around Bel Air and other places like that, you will find whole sections that are reserved for not only this, but everything else that the Jewish Passover will be required. And it's not just some company that's baking this or providing it. That that is kosher must be baked, it must be prepared under the direct supervision of uh, a priest, okay? And so they take that, the patriarch takes that, and he'll take some unleavened bread, and he'll put it in an envelope while using that plate to remember the plagues, he takes the matzak and he puts it in what they call an envelope and he, they even use this word, they bury it for later. They put it under a cushion, they put it in a drawer, they'll hide it 
and then the meal proceeds. They enjoy the meal. It's roasted lamb. Make lamb, amen. I used to have lamb and everything, but people started eating it up before I could get to it. And so I don't do that anymore. But they enjoy it. It's a meal. It's a family meal. They enjoy everything. The passage, remember I'm through with two cups. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus took bread. Okay? When it says he took bread, the patriarch goes, the Madzak that was buried, he goes back. Remember, it's buried actually back here. He goes and he resurrects the bread. Now, the Jews, they've been doing this since Moses' time. They don't have a clue of what they're doing. It's a shadow to them. But they go and they resurrect the bread that's not a false riser. And during the meal, the Bible says that Jesus resurrects this. He takes this. And right after the meal, he takes the cup after the meal. This cup is the third cup. It is called, that's called the cup of blessing, cup of plague. Jews know this as the cup of redemption. Cup of redemption. Jesus takes the third cup, the cup after the meal. Cup after the meal. Have y'all read this Bible? Takes the cup after the meal. It's called the cup of redemption. Jesus said, this is my shed blood, shed for you. Shed for many. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Prior to him saying that, he has resurrected the Madzak, and he said, this is my body. It is broken for you. It's on the pureness of the napkin or envelope that's there. He uses these two elements to establish what we share as Christians. Now, the last cup is never used by the Jewish family. It's never used. They're waiting. This is called Elijah's cup. Because when you read the Old Testament, there's a promise that Elijah, the prophet, would return. And so they've saved him a cup. The problem for them is that Jesus tells us that the spirit of Elijah has come in the person of John the Baptist. So Jesus takes this cup. He doesn't throw this cup away. He said, this is actually the cup of praise. He said, I'm not going to drink any more of this cup until we all drink it together in heavenly places. He gives every element of this Lord's Supper, if you will, or this Passover, he gives meaning to it. Now, I will tell you that the envelope that had, and that's why I want to go into it, the envelope that had the Matzak in it actually is only one of three envelopes that are there. The Jews, for years, had been looking at these three envelopes with all of them having bread in them, been looking at this, and they have said, said and shared that they represent the children of Israel. In other words, the 12 tribes. Because on the high priest's breastplate, there are three rows of four to represent all of the tribes of Israel. They say that this represents four, this represents four, and this represents four. Jesus helps us to understand that that's not it. He says when, when the medzak is taken and hid, he always used the middle one. They always use the middle one because this represents the sun. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it is the Son that made the sacrifice. It is him that is broken that we might have a right to the tree of life. It is his blood that is shed for us. Jesus takes these elements 
And he establishes for us what we call the Lord's Supper. He said, do this in remembrance of me. How long, Lord, till I come back? And one day, one of these glad mornings, we'll fly away, and when the time is right, our Savior will lift this fourth cup, and he'll say, I made a promise, I'm making it good, and we're all here together. He says he won't drink any more until we all get to heaven. This is the, a brief thumbnail sketch of the Passover. Brothers and sisters, when we come together in our church setting, I don't care what church you belong to, if it is Christian, under the authority of Almighty God, who is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, he said, do this. One of the red flags, if you've got a church that doesn't honor this, it's not Christian. We may be different in a lot of ways. Some, some uh, churches have the pulpit on either side. Some have it in the middle. Some have the communion table down. Some of it have it up. All of that, that's fine. But this means that we're all one of the same family. And one of these days, he's coming back. Find a church without spot or wrinkle, and he'll take us home to be with him. What a time. What a time. What a time. Amen. If you all will, if you'll play softly, minister. What we want to do tonight to... Uh, conclude our uh, Good Friday sharing, our celebration is one of three opportunities that you have to share in the Lord's Supper. Uh, we will uh, do this three times uh, during this Holy Week. Uh, one is tonight. You are welcome to commune with us. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've been baptized to show your faith in him in that way, uh, it does not matter to us what your church home is, the name of it is, it does not matter. It does not matter where it's located. Uh, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, we accept you. If you've not accepted him, I offer him to you tonight. He is a safe bet. What I want you to do is prepare your hearts. The Bible says that all who will, let them come. Who am I to stop anybody from accepting Christ? It's a relationship. It's a koinonia. It means that you have a right to the relationship with Jesus Christ, you and he. But you don't get to make it up as you go. If you're going to live and operate under his authority, you've got to know his word so that you won't dishonor him and live according to what he has called you to be and do. Young people, I need you to know that the Lord never leaves any of us out. Jesus had 12 disciples. One of them was a traitor, but the other was a very, very young, uh, young man. That was John. His writing is considered the Gospel of John. John was the youngest. We know uh, by writings that John couldn't have been any older than 19, couldn't have been any younger than 17. But he is probably one of the most prolific of the disciples. He is the one that was stranded on the Isle of Patmos. He is the one that the Lord revealed much to. And he is the one that as they said at the Passover meal, G Jesus and John with his head on his chest he says Lord which one he say is it I that will betray you Jesus tells John John tells the others and he tells us Jesus said the one that dippeth with me in the dish he is the one and Jesus revealed the traitor by dri dipping with Judas Iscariot some have said Judas didn't have a chance. I want you to know that the very verbiage that Jesus used gives Judas a chance. He said, that what you must do, do quickly. The interpretation, however, is a little bit more pointed than that because Greek is just that way. It's that kind of it's pointed. He, 
Jesus tells Judah simply this, make up your mind. Brothers and sisters, it really boils down to whether you're going to accept him or deny him. And that's exactly what it was on that night. And tonight, after sharing those brief little thumbnail sketches, I need you to know we have the same choice. We can either accept him and live under his authority, or we can reject him and go our own way. Whatever you choose to do, just know that I'm riding with Jesus. Amen? Let's get our deacons. white for purity. As you came in, I believe that uh, our deacons uh, serve you the items or the elements, uh, the, the Lord's Supper elements uh, for this Lord's Supper on tonight. If you intend to share with us on tonight and you've not been served, simply elevate your hand and we will have our deacons to serve you. Is there anyone that desires to have the communion with us and desires to be served that has not been served? Everyone has been served that desires to be served. During the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, a lot had happened. As a matter of fact, the Passover uh, well, the year, the, the months preceding the Passover in Scripture, it would have been fallish winter time. So the Feast of Tabernacles would have taken place as a conclusion to that year. Jesus was on the scope of the Jewish leaders. They wanted to kill him. Jesus actually moved through a couple of crowds to avoid them. He said simply, my time is not yet. And so they sought opportunity to get Jesus away from the crowd. They knew that the crowd, the people, wouldn't have it. And so they wanted to get him away. It just so happens there was a crook in the midst of Jesus' 12. The Bible says Judas became indignant because Jesus corrected him. He was at a meal. All the disciples were at a meal. And this woman sought to honor Jesus. She poured a very valuable, a very expensive uh, alabaster box of oil. She anointed Jesus with it. And it ruffled Judas' feathers. Uh, he concocted this story that it could have been sold. We could have helped many poor people. Jesus, John adds that Judas only said that because he held the money bags and he had stolen from the money. Has anybody read this Bible? Scriptures tell us that uh, when Jesus corrected him, leave that woman alone. 
she has anointed me for the day of my burial. You will have the poor with you always. Do what you're supposed to do, but leave her alone. The Bible says from that time on, Judas sought opportunity to betray Jesus. He looked for an opportunity. And now, at the Passover, Jesus reveals him by saying, make up your mind. Jesus has revealed him. Instead of him falling on his knees and saying, Master, forgive me, he could have. I have sinned. He could have. He could have said, forgive me. And do you know that God is good of his word? He would have been forgiven. But the Lord knows all. The Bible says that Satan had already taken Judas over. And he moved from that, past, from that upper room, finding the high priest and others. And he asked the question, what would you give me for me to give him to you? They counted out the bag. It came to 30 pieces of silver. It was then that Jesus had the, Lord's, the Passover and established the Lord's Supper without Judas. And after finishing the Passover meal and establishing the Lord's Supper, the Bible says they got up, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Judas Iscariot led the enemy right to Jesus and kissed him as a sign to show he was the one instead of the other 11 there. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus established this Lord's Supper, he gave us clear instructions. He said, do this. Now, we're going to do this tonight. In sunrise service, we will have a great gathering. We will hear the word of God. We will have a wonderful preparation. We'll have prayers. We'll have worship. And we will once again at the end of that service, we will share with the rest of our gathering flock and those in the community that join us the Lord's Supper. Then we will have breakfast together. Amen. Amen. And then at 10 a.m., oh, the sunrise service is 6.30 a.m. Breakfast, there are about 8.30 to 8.45. And then at our 10 a.m., we will have our uh, morning worship, which will contain our speeches for our babies. And there's a great drama of all the story that I just shared. They've been preparing for you. We'll have songs of Easter season, and we will bless the Lord and then conclude by one final opportunity. The Bible says as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of him. During the meal, Jesus took bread, but before he shared with his disciples, the word of the Lord declares that he looked to heaven and he blessed it. In other words, he prayed. I'm asking that Reverend Hunter will ask the Lord's favor on the bread. It represents the body of Christ. Precious Savior, once again, we pause on this Good Friday night to say thank you. O oh Lord, over 2,000 years ago, you set this ordinance in order. And you shared with your disciples, you shared with them. You said, as often as you do this, you do this in my remembrance. Now, Lord, as we take this bread that represents your body, we ask the blessing in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And thank God. After the meal came the cup. It is the cup of the New Testament.
It represents a new agreement between God and man based only on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. But before he shared that third cup, that cup of redemption with his disciples, the Bible says that he looked to heaven and he blessed it. In other words, he prayed. I'm asking that Reverend Cole will ask God's favor on the fruit of the vine. It represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Rock of ages, ancient of days, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. But we know without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. So thank you for what we couldn't do for ourselves. Blessed in the name of Jesus, amen. Jewish matzak is used. These wafers we use, they are unleavened, but you have been served unleavened bread, like I used as an example. I'm gonna ask that the unleavened is brought from the table, right here. And give me one, one plate. You should have unleavened in your packets. I saw someone come in. Does anyone else need to be served? Bless the unleavened. Bless the unleavened. Unleavened. Who else? Everyone, bless the unleavened. Yeah. Thank you. Secondly came the cup. It is the shed blood of Jesus. Shed blood of Jesus Christ. Shed for you. Shed for me. Shed for many. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Shed blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Shed blood of Jesus. Anyone else? Dick, you need? Okay. All right. Same one. Everyone still good? Now the fruit of the vine has a seal of protection on it. If you have difficulty opening that, look to your brother or sister to the right or the left, and then if they can't help you, raise your hand, our deacons will do so. Thank you, deacon. Shed blood of Jesus. All right. Thank you, sir. Has everyone been served? During the meal, Jesus took bread. He broke it. He said, this is my body. It is broken for you. Take this and eat it all of you.
That little wafer that's on the top of there, just leave that there. Anyone having difficulty? You need some help? After the meal came the cup. This is the cup of the New Testament. It represents a new agreement between God and man based only on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Without his shedding blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. He said, take this and drink it all of you. For by his stripes, we are healed. I want to thank you all for being here with us. If you have any questions, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've got some questions, I'd dearly love to speak with you. We've got other ministers and deacons who are here that can certainly uh, share with you the good word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we uh, invite your questions. We invite your uh, membership. We invite your fellowship. It's been a great day. May the Lord bless you. We've got our ushers coming through, uh, picking up the refuse. So if you've got those little baggies, amen, you still got some things in there, make sure that, amen. So the Rayon got that going. Amen. What have we forgotten? I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to sunrise service. Okay. I, I hope you are too. Why don't we all stand? Uh, minister, why don't we sing our way out of here? All right. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. All right now. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget, no, how can I forget what you've done for me, how can I forget how you set me free, how can I forget how you brought me out, Jesus, I'll never forget, no, Lord, we thank you so very much for your divine favor. You are an awesome and a great God. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for the camaraderie. Thank you, Master, for all you do. Thank you for health and strength. Those who have not been able, because of their health condition, not able to come and join in with us on this year. Thank you, dear Lord, for their looking this way by faith. Sister. Jasper's in that number. We pray for Sister Fleming and the, the Pearson family. We pray, amen, as they prepare to share in the celebration of the homegoing of Joseph Fleming. We ask, dear Lord, that you will be their company keeper. Help us for such a time as this. But we look forward, we set our face toward Resurrection Sunday. We thank you, Lord, for it. We thank you for Jesus that makes this life worth living. We thank you, Master, that you look beyond our fault and apply it to our need. We need it, your Lord, and so we thank you for meeting that need. Now we have a heavenly home to look forward to. Bless us on every leaning side, and we'll be so grateful to give your name the praise for it all. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before our maker and creator. May his love and his spirit rest, rule, and abide with each of us until we meet again. Let us all respond. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Nobody leave without a hug and a handshake.